so uh, hi everyone. Thank you uh, for attending the expo. I'm sure you're sort of introducing the committee and all the uh, you know all the work that sort of got into this event. So we again really appreciate you guys being here, and we'd like to get uh, the talk started off today uh, with Lenny Isabella to pronounce it. Um, he is uh, from Alvarez, and um, he'll be uh, delving a little bit into. Uh, we're talking about Alvarez now. It's a. Uh, I'll get into there. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, just to get things started off, he'll sort of be discussing Alvarez, sort of their projects, and having uh, uh, in that space. So uh, let's give it up for him. Blockchain uh, is tamper-proof, securing our data and our wealth. Um, transparent so we can validate what we see. There's no fake news in the blockchain. Um, and blockchain even enables trust between people who have never met. So there's a, uh, many applications of blockchain. I don't know use cases. I think people in this room probably have thought of some. Um, but all these together can, is this coming in OK? Uh, all these uh, together can unlock our physical and digital lives um, so they can intermingle and uh, we can conduct you know, business and play uh, um, on the blockchain safely and rapidly um, without concern for borders in this new economy. Unfortunately, blockchains have an open secret. Um, they, as I just defined, um, that definition of a blockchain doesn't really exist. There are many claims of different projects being decentral. I'm decentral over here, they're decentral over there. But the reality is that de decentralization is aspirational only. The technology doesn't currently exist um, to be truly decentral. The Ethereum founder famously stated, um, after looking around at all the blockchains at that time, uh, apparently blockchains can contain at most two of security, decentralization, and scalability. So if you think about that, what does that mean? Well, this, which one of these do we want to give up on? Security? It doesn't really make sense to lose security if I want to secure my money. If you can take my money from me, it's probably not a place I'm going to play. Decentralization? Well, uh, you know, if you don't need decentralization, why even consider a blockchain? We've had databases for decades. And finally, scalability. And this is the one that uh, I think the existing projects mostly um, have uh, punted on. Um, but without scalability, there's billions of people in the world that want to interact and transact. Um, without uh, being able to meet their needs, we don't really have something that can support that borderless economy vision of ours. So I think that if you can't support all three of these, that is an un unacceptable situation. Luckily for us, that's not true. It is actually possible to, to meet all that, and I'll get into that in a second. And blockchains are a technical construct. So if the technology that we have today is not working for us, we just need better technology. So let's take a look at do I have the pointer that works here. Let's take a look at what, what does a blockchain really do? There's, really only two th uh, main things here. You can get into subtle details on that data, the payload itself, but the blockchain itself builds a chain and um, secures it, and the building part requires picking the next block. Securing the chain is actually pretty easy. You can use um, hashing technology that's probably 50 years old, hash the prior block in the next block, and you have a secure chain. The real problem is how do you select that next block? So we look at some of the existing popular approaches. Proof of work, we owe Bitcoin a lot. Uh, they, they came up with a lot of interesting concepts that uh, kicked off this entire space. And with proof of work, you, you have a computational uh, competition uh, where we race to solve some crypto riddle. And whoever wins gets to append that block. It sounds really good because we have a block now. Unfortunately, with any winner-takes-all competition, you have a lot of losers. And all that work that they did is effectively dissipated as heat. Additionally, um, the, 
um, proof of work system has to be intentionally slow. The crypto puzzle has to be hard enough that we don't end up with many simultaneous solutions or we'll end up with a lot of uh, soft forks that we have to resolve. And finally, proof of work um, is computational and electrically expensive, and those costs um, aren't um, easy to bear by everyone. So the people who are willing and have the ability to pay for those de facto centralize proof of work systems. So then we have this other system called delegated proof of stake. It's a really easy system conceptually. We pick 21 people, and they decide what that next block will be for us. Uh, it's fast and easy, but it's completely centralized. Um, and finally, if, finally, even if they happen to be 20 really honest people, we know after some period of time who they are, and we can corrupt them, we can DOS them, we can find some way to exploit them. So there's another uh, system that we see around called bonded proof of stake. You take your money, you stick it in the middle of the table, and you can't touch that amount of money. Anyone who does this will now have a, um, a voice in the system and can help decide what that next block is. If you make a mistake, if you are malicious, if you do something wrong, they will take your bond away from you, um, a punishment. And so that should make everyone honest. Unfortunately, all that really does is it, um, make sure that you do a little bit of math to ensure you generate more from your exploit or your bad behavior than the bond that you will then forfeit. So what we have... Um, is technology holding us back, uh, so we need that better technology. And with Algorand, we have pure proof of stake, our own brand of proof of stake. What does that mean? Well, pure proof of stake to us means it's secure by default. There will always be thieves, there will always be malicious users. Um, you, what you need to do is not deal with them after the fact, follow them to the Bahamas once they have taken your money. You need to make sure that cheating is impossible from the beginning. Additionally, pure proof of stake means that all the tokens everywhere have the same voice. There are no classes of users, there's no miners or delegates that decide for you. Everyone has the same voting rights. And you don't have to forfeit some amount of your money to vote. All your money, whether it's money in your wallet, money you're using in a financial instrument, uh, money in a bond, all that will count toward your stake and your ability to vote. So here's Algorand in action. Try this later as we point out. We, what we have here is um, a block, the first block. And while the challenge in a blockchain is picking that next block, the first block is actually pretty easy to pick because the Genesis block is part of the definition of your blockchain system. And what we have next to it is, I borrowed some of these slides from my founder, Silvio. Um, and he is fond of the feather being a, um, a metaphor, I guess, for ease and lightness. So let's follow that feather as it works its way down um, where it, and see how hard it is to build a Algorand blockchain. The blocks fall, follow one after another um, as the chain unfolds. And there are no forks, no proof of work. Um, the Algorand blockchain um, does not use any of these concepts. And so all the transactions are final as soon as they occur. That means if you buy, uh, buy something and that uh, transaction makes it into the blockchain, it cannot be removed ever. You can take possession of your car, you can move into your house. It's, there won't be some longest chain later on that will come around and invalidate that. How do we achieve this? Well, we achieve this by using um, a protocol called the Byzantine Agreement. It's a communication protocol um, that came about by Peace, Shostek, and Lamport back in 1980. And uh, um, it ensures two properties if the, uh, a majority of the players are honest. Those two properties are, the first is agreement. If you have a value um, in your head, at the end of a conversation, we will all agree on the same value. And the second um, property is if we start off with a particular value, all of us, um, in our heads, at the end of the conversation, we will um, commit to that value. So agreement without consistency isn't that useful because we could always agree on to resolve on the same value, or the, the number zero, regardless of what values we start with. And the way this maps to a blockchain is if you think of these values as the potential um, blocks that are being proposed. So 
Doesn't team agreement definitely works. There's a lot of proofs for, of how it works. Unfortunately, it has some challenges as well. It's incredibly slow. The algorithm when it came out um, really only scaled to 12 users, and additionally, it requires those users to be known. So all the players um, had to be known ahead of time, and that doesn't really work in a um, borderless economy with billions of users where people are going online and offline continuously. However, we have solved these problems with a um, version of Byzantine Agreement um, that follows all the models but is able to scale um, to the world's population. The, I can't go into the details of that, but we will probably release that paper in more detail shortly. So what, in summary, what do we have from the Algorand uh, Byzantine Consensus Protocol? We have trivial computation. It takes a couple of um, bits of arithmetic, a signature, and some verification. And that um, computation is so simple that it's possible to do it on a Raspberry Pi. Um, it's completely decentralized um, because there's only one user class. I have my uh, timer here is flashing at me, so I'm going to speed up a little bit and probably skip some things. And um, no forks are possible, or rather, math mathematically effectively impossible. It would basically take the age of the universe for another fork to occur. The scalability is um, impressive, and it's secure against a very bad adversary, an adversary that's that bad. An adversary capable of instantly corrupting anyone, up to a third of the population. An adversary, once it corrupts someone, owns them completely and can force them to generate any kind of messages that they would want. And it is able to not just manipulate the protocol, but also attack the very communication network itself. Um, but despite all this, it's unable to impact the um, digital signatures. And because of that, Algorand remains secure. So, the question you, know, you may want to ask yourself is, do you really need to be hardened to that kind of threat? And I think um, you know, in light of the existing projects, most of them will not even come close to um, handling an adversary of that caliber. But if the world's economy is running on a blockchain, there'll be trillions of dollars at stake. And I think we know that all the adversaries in the world will take their shot um, at trying to attack that. So I'm going to sprint here a little bit. Um, uh, there's basically two um, steps to the Algorand um, process. There's a proposals uh, step and an agreement step. The agreement step all relies on thousand-person committees, and the reason for that is um, if in any um, population, there will always be some amount of bad actors. If you rely on one block proposer, that percentage will be manifest in that proposer. So say it's 10%, which would be a really high adversarial rate in any um, population. Um, that means 10% of your blocks will be malicious. The committee, however, by using um, a distribution uh, on that 1,000 people, um, ha has a um, infinitesimally unlikely possibility of being adversarial as a whole um, if it connects um, with that block. And I think I'm going to wrap up there simply because I'm out of time. Um, but I'm happy to take up any um, questions you may have. If they give me some time here, um, I'll also let you know that the product is currently running. And in fact, we have servers around the rural on our test network. We have. Um, a developer website where you can engage with us, get on a test net, and even build against Algorand today. Thank you. So we do have time for one question. Okay. Yeah. Very generous of you. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, is from what I've read about Algorand, you guys are all planning on scaling on a single state, or are you thinking at all about you know the future? Oh, sorry future state of the world incorporating sharding or cross-chain communication or anything like that, or are you just staying on a single state machine? So I, I, if I can rephrase your question, I think what you said is, um, is there only one effective um, shard in Algorand, um, or are we going to shard Algorand? Well, I think we all probably are clever enough to realize no matter how fast you make a blockchain, even if you have a 1,000 plus transactions per second, um, there are probably use cases where a million would be nice or 10 million. And that's not going to happen on one global um, view. Um, so we definitely have plans over the longer term um, to support those other use cases um, using different techniques. Um, but our version one ver um, timeline, we're going to have that one global cons um, view uh, where we still support that incredible performance. Are there any more questions? You can do one more. Anybody? 
All right, well, thank you very much for your time. And if you, oh, I'm sorry. This is just a tactical thing. Can you share your slides because you have to rush to the rest of the presentation? Uh, so they have my slides, actually. Yeah. So they're sharing the slides, and you can get them from them. And you're, of course, always welcome to come to me, and I can give it to you. All right, thank so you. one more round of applause. <laughs>